Right then. Um, okay, folks, I think we'll get started. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and, you know, we'll soon be at a boat trip, so don't panic. It'll be fine. Um, my name is Matt. Hello. Hi. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, Unity for Enterprise Developers. And before we get started, I need a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, firstly, I am not a Unity developer, but it's okay because I'm not an enterprise developer either. So uh, that's fine. Um, I, uh, I am actually sort of like a, a Unity tools developer. So I don't actually uh, build Unity games as such. I haven't shipped a Unity game, um, I, but I do write uh, and work on the tools for Unity within Rider. So I work for JetBrains. Uh, part of the, the uh, sort of the rider team, the developer advocate team, uh, and I helped sort of work with that there. So just as a bit of a disclaimer, as I'm not actually a Unity developer, but I kind of still do some stuff. So um, what do I mean by uh, Unity for enterprise developers? Um, I think a quick question is, um, is anybody actually using Unity right now? Right. Yep. And that's kind of proving my point really is um, we, we kind of, we're all .NET developers, you know, so we, we're at this kind of, uh, this .NET um, conference, we're all .NET developers. Unity is a .NET based game engine. So why aren't we all writing Unity games? And uh, it, it's really been very interesting working around the Unity space because you kind of see that there is very little overlap between sort of uh, traditional .NET and uh, the Unity .NET world. So coming to a conference like this, you get lots of conversations about ASP.NET MVC core and um, .NET Core and multi-platform and containers and all that kind of stuff. And if you go to a Unity conference, a game dev conference, you would be surprised at how many times test-driven development does not come up. So um, there's a very thin uh, overlap here, uh, and yet we've we've all got sort of uh, transferable skills. You know, C Sharp is a C Sharp uh, uh, game engine, uh, so we could be writing games. But the question is kind of where do we start? How do we kind of get started with this? So um, back up just a little bit. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, seen Unity, which was most of you there, um, what is it? It's a game engine. We know that. That's OK. But what, what's a game engine then? So it is something that provides us with a sort of low level building blocks for creating games. So it gives us um, all that we need to create some graphics, uh, to use physics as well, so things can collide. So you know when things are hitting each other and you know when your player gets shot and all that kind of stuff. Um, features for animation, audio, effects, explosions, and fireworks, and all that kind of stuff. And also uh, interactivity as well. And this is really useful. What happens when two objects do collide? What happens when your player does get shot? What happens when their hit points and their health hits down, gets down to zero? And um, it's not really just games either, um, but uh, it is very, very popular for games. And uh, I forget the stats now, but it's something like, um, you know, there's a very good chance that. Uh, in your, on your phones right now, any of the games you've got have been written by Unity. There's a huge amount of support for mobile gaming in Unity. So things like Monument Valley, um, Pokemon Go, which was a, a massive hit as well, and the, the new Mario Kart Tour are all Unity games. But it's not, oh, and it's important to point out as well that it's um, consoles and, and desktops as well. It's got full support for those and they're available on other platforms too. But it's not just games as well. Unity is used in movies. Uh, so the Lion King and um, the, the remake of the Jungle Book have all used Unity as part of their sort of pre-visualization stuff, as part of the uh, uh, design of the, the special effects. They've used it for VR headsets while they're on set, which is you know, usually, just, usually just a big green screen to sort of see what's going on there and sort of get a good visualization of what's happening. Uh, and Disney have used it as well for um, Big Hero 6 animated shorts, where they've used it as the actual renderer as well. Everything was made in Unity. Uh, and also um, something which could perhaps be used from more of a sort of enterprise kind of uh, point of view is, is sort of uh, data visualization, customer facing uh, marketing. So you can do sort of promotional work here with um, this, this nice shiny advert for um, a, a BMW. It's like one of those cars is, is ray traced in Unity and the other one is real, but you know I have no idea which one. Um, but also things like data visualization, um, augmented reality, virtual reality. We've got something up here from the team. It was a hackathon project to create a view of dot memory data inside virtual reality, which is, <laughs> they had a lot of fun doing. I'm not entirely sure how useful it is. And I don't expect it to ship anytime soon, but uh, it, it's certainly uh, an interesting project. Data visualization as well, sort of scientific kind of idea. Um, great example off the internet here. If you ever wanted to see exactly uh, how much fuel a Saturn V rocket uses in terms of elephants, that's, that's what's going on there. Why you'd want to do that, I don't quite know, but it's a great example. 
So what I'm trying to show, say really is there's lots of reasons to try it. It's not necessarily just about games, uh, but maybe it is. Maybe you want to pick up a hobby. You want to do uh, games uh, as a hobby or maybe even as a change of career. Um, I worked with a gentleman who uh, was working in a bank. He stopped working in a bank, uh, went off, made video games, has got his own game studio and doing very nicely. So maybe you do. But there's also ways of using it in, uh, in your current roles as well, so the data visualization, customer focus stuff as well. So how do I write a game in Unity? And I know I've just said you can use it for other things other than games, but it's just going to be a whole lot easier to say games rather than interactive experiences and stuff. Um, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to, I've only got an hour here, so I can't really sort of sit here and explain how to build a game here uh, I'd be able to show you the two circles there and you'd be having to fill in the rest, which is uh, all a bit much. So um, the idea that I've kind of had here really is how to build a game in Unity. That's kind of the known unknowns. This is the thing I know that I don't know. I know what to go and do to go and find this. I can go to Google. I can find the tutorials. I can run through the hands-on labs. I can actually get going at it. What I wanted to focus on was something a bit different. So the unknown unknowns, the things I do not know that I do not know. And sort of try and cover some of the foundational type stuff, the stuff that you pick up as you've used Unity, but that is not really sort of called out as part of the, um, uh, the tutorials and things. So a bit of a sort of grounding of how things, uh, how things work. So we'll start with some sort of uh, foundational type stuff. Uh, and sort of state some of the obvious kinds of things here. So things that, uh, again, you don't necessarily uh, know from the tutorials, but it's really useful. So firstly, Unity is the application. So Unity is in control here. It runs your game. Uh, the great example here is that if you think of something like ASP.NET MVC Core, that's a C-sharp app that just happens to run a website. Whereas Unity is a game that happens to run your C-sharp. The control is kind of is flipped there. So uh, it's very important. We are used, uh, as C-sharp developers, we're used to sort of being the, the whole world and owning everything. And this isn't quite right in Unity. That's a really sort of useful thing to know when using Unity. It's like, know your place, know where you are, where you fit in with all of this. Um, the other useful thing to know is um, the Unity editor is a Unity application. It sounds really obvious, but it took me ages to realize that. And once you do it, it's like, ah, that makes a whole lot more sense. Um, everything you see in the Unity editor is Unity code. And uh, that means you can extend the Unity editor through Unity, so you can add extra features into it uh, and work with it. Other useful things to know is that the core engine is native code. It's C++. It's portable. It's cross-platform, but it's still C++. You use C Sharp and Mono. You don't use any other .NET framework or .NET Core. You use Mono to add your game logic. And you talk to the Unity API uh, through essentially P invoke. It's not quite, but it, you, basically through P invoke. Um, fortunately, you don't have to deal with that when you're writing Unity code. You work with a whole load of uh, managed wrapper objects. Um, but it's important to know because sooner or later, your code is going to talk to some native code, and there is a cost to that transition. So if at some point you're concerned about performance, then all of these transitions into native code uh, can uh, affect your performance. Um, another useful thing to know is that it is a single threaded application, more or less. Um, it, the API is not thread safe. Everything happens on a single thread. Um, and uh, all of your calls, uh, sorry, as Unity is updating your objects, uh, they get called every single frame on the main thread there. So if you're doing a lot of work, you're going to interrupt the flow of the game. So you need to sort of uh, watch what you're doing there. Um, the API is not thread safe, so you want to avoid using threads unless you know what you're doing. Um, and generally, even then, you should probably avoid them. Um, there are ways of working with things. So again, if you do some long running task, uh, you're going to block the frames. Uh, so you can use something called coroutines, which allows you to batch up your work into uh, chunks which can run in between threads. Uh, or you can also use the job system, which is effectively a wrapper around Unity's native threading system there. Otherwise, you're going to end up with too many thread pools and things going on. Right. Um, building blocks. How do you build a game? What's a Unity application game built up from? And there's a few of these kinds of things. You've got scenes, game objects, and components. This is a sort of hierarchy then of how everything fits together. Uh, and then you've got prefabs and assets, and we'll have a look at those in a minute. Um, scenes are very easy. You can think of a scene as a level in a game. 
it's a, a level or it's the menu options uh, page uh, and uh, within that then you have game objects and components. Game objects are the fundamental building blocks of everything and by themselves they're not very interesting. They don't do anything. They've got no functionality by default. So they've got no graphics, they've got no um, interactivity, no actions, no nothing. So they are containers and by default they're basically empty. Everything in your game is a game object. And um, this includes things like characters, vehicles, scenery, lights, all these kinds of things. They're all game objects. And game objects are hierarchical as well. So if you imagine, for example, a tank in a game, you've got uh, a game object which represents that vehicle. Uh, if you've got then a turret, which is going to be sort of rotating on the top of that to target other things, that's going to be a separate game object, but it's going to be a child. So you've got this kind of hierarchical um, uh, structure going on here. Game objects are also um, a container for components as well. And components are the things which add functionality to a game object. So you've got this sort of hierarchical structure going on. All game objects by default have one trans uh, component, a transform component, and this is giving it its location within the world. You get a position, a rotation, and a scale. Uh, but beyond that, you have to add components to get anything else. There's a whole bunch of different components you can add to give different things. So you can have uh, a mesh to add some graphics. So if you're going to have your tank, the actual way the tank looks is added through a mesh. You can have a rigid body component to give it, uh, give it mass and gravity and uh, physics and things to allow it to uh, collide with stuff. It can be an audio source and play a sound. Uh, it can be a particle system with fireworks and smoke and stuff like that. And it can also add logic through scripts, which is uh, really useful. So the next thing then is uh, prefabs. Uh, I'm not going into too much detail about this, but as the name suggests, these are pre-configured game objects complete with components. Uh, a great example again is the tank. If you've got a, a tank, all the different components which make that up and all the different game objects, you can save that and you can store it outside of a scene and you get to reuse it. So you can create them sort of uh, programmatically through code uh, or through the uh, user interface. Uh, and a good example of that is like a wave of enemies. You just use a, a, a prefab and create a whole bunch of enemies there and reuse this information, uh, the, these prefabs. Right, well, let's have a quick look. Uh, so this is Unity, all very nice. And this is the kind of default scene that you get to see. It's uh, sort of empty by default. You've got a window at the top left here, which is the scene view. This shows you the models that are going on and the game objects that are in your, uh, your particular scene. Uh, down the bottom, you've got a game view. And this is what you can view if you press play. This is how the game would play and how it would look. Um, by default, you just get this sort of default sky box, as it's called. So you can just sort of see off to the horizon. In the top here, you've got your hierarchy of game objects. Um, so this scene, the sample scene, has got two objects by default. It's got a main camera and a directional light. That's all that's going on in there. And it's really quite boring. Uh, and then down the bottom here, we've got three other little tabs. You've got a console for giving you debugging type information, an inspector, which uh, you can use then to look at information about particular game objects and components. So it's actually showing you all the components that are attached to this game object here. You've got a transform, which is the position within the world, uh, and then the sort of camera details as well. Uh, and then uh, you've got your project window here as well. So you get to see what files are in the project. And what we can do very easily is create a new game object you can create a, a whole bunch of different things. We can create, say, for example, oh, lost it. Create a cube, and that will add me a cube into my uh, scene view here. And I can sort of, uh, I can rotate that. Well, I can move it around. I can rotate if I hit the right key. There we go. I can rotate around it. Uh, we can view the, the the cube itself. We have the game object in the top right, and I can uh, view the inspector and I can see the transform, and I can uh, change the location within the scene very easily and work with it. It's got a, uh, um, a cube mesh assigned to it. I can say, well, OK, let's change that to be a cylinder or a sphere. Or I can use some of the meshes that are already in the project uh, and use something like, that one's a bit small, whatever that one is. Let's call something, I don't know what it's called, a turret. Uh, and we can then. Uh, zoom out and you can see that we've got now got a, um, a a different mesh assigned to this particular object. Uh, what we can also do is we can add components and we can uh, add a whole bunch of different components here. There's a whole load of things we can do. 
We can very easily add in a rigid body, which gives it a mass. Uh, and I'll tell you what, let's, let's get rid of this one first. If I, what I can do at the top here is I've got my con uh, controls to switch me into play mode. So if I click play, I then sort of start playing the scene and it does whatever the, the scene is set up to do. And because we've got a boring sample scene, it's doing nothing. One thing I can very easily do then is add a rigid body component, which is going to give me some uh, mass and gravity to my object. And if I, uh, let's make this uh, raise up a little higher. If I press play now, what should happen is that gravity applies and the thing falls. There's nothing for it to fall onto, so it's just going to keep on falling forever and ever because there's nothing to fall onto it. But it, we can do uh, some interesting things there, and you can build things up from there. But let's have a look at something a little more interesting. So this is a project which I've downloaded from the Asset Store, which I'll explain uh, about in a minute. It's a starter kit. Uh, and it's a sample project which is useful to uh, look at and uh, see how things are working. And you get like a, a level here which you can sort of zoom around and see what's going on. Uh, you can also um, see that it's got some uh, user interface. I've no idea why the user interface is quite so large on this, but there we go is in relation to the rest of the um, uh, scene. But you can still see what's going on there. And you can see now we've got a more complex hierarchy on the right hand side there as well. So we can click on things like, um, uh, where am I going? It's navigation objects there, and that will show me uh, all the objects that are selected as part of all that. And I can uh, go to headquarters there, and I can focus on headquarters. And again, I can sort of rotate around that. I can see my inspector, and I can see the object. Again, this one's got uh, a transform, and I can modify that and move things around. But it's not just then sort of objects which are sort of physical objects within the world as well. We can have some things like configuration. So there's a wave manager here, something that controls the waves that come in as part of this game. And we have uh, 10 waves as part of this. They're all timed waves here. And these waves themselves are more game objects. So the game objects are containing data which I'm using as part of my scene. And if I double click on that, it takes me to the inspector for this one. And it shows me all the spawn instructions, the things that will happen when this wave fires. And it's going to spawn off enemies. And I can see that actually it's going to spawn off uh, 16 enemies. Uh, and these are the agents that are going to use. And these are prefabs here. And I can select them. And so I can select whether it's going to be a hover boss or a hover buggy or a hover tank. And once it's selected, I can then sort of uh, double click on that to show the prefab that's there. Uh, and if I show that there, we can see that that's the uh, object that's going to get spawned and run with us. And so if I run this now, um, we can see down the bottom here, we've now got our game view. And this is what you would see now as the actual game itself that's playing. And so I can interact with it. I can click Start Wave. And that'll start things off. I can grab a tower, uh, drop it onto the uh, thing. Uh, and you can see now we've got our enemies spawning and we're fighting. I can pause that. And now if I go to, uh, if I go back over here, I can then select my uh, turret. And we can see that it's um, just another item in the scene view, it's another game object. And if I get my effector there, I can change the fire rate to something like 10 and unpause it. And you can now see that it's going crazy and it's shooting a whole lot faster there. So I can actually modify my game objects while the game's running and work with my code and my game as I'm building it all up there. OK. Um, if anybody has any questions, by the way, please feel free to just shout out. Otherwise, I'll just uh, keep on going. Um, next thing I want to show you really is the, the project structure. And this, again, sort of underlines how things are different to how we used to in the C-sharp world. So for example, the Unity projects are folder-based. There are no project files. There's no sort of C-sharp project files. We're used to being uh, solution files, C-sharp project files, and so on. This doesn't happen in the Unity world. We open up a folder. Um, and again, this is sort of underlining the fact that this is a Unity project. It's not a C-sharp project. Uh, the C-sharp is just a part of the Unity world. Being a full-stack developer in a Unity world means knowing about sort of graphics, audio, level design, um, um, uh, audio and music and all these kinds of things as well, um, rather than just knowing about the C-sharp. 
When you start a project, these are the three folders you get, assets, packages, and project settings. Project settings contains a whole bunch of uh, configuration, which is useful, uh, things like um, uh, what target platform you're, you're uh, aiming for, uh, what version you're targeting, and so on. Uh, and these are what you put into source control. Everything else then can be excluded. When you open up a project, there's a whole bunch more thing, files get uh, generated. So we end up now with a, a library folder and a temp folder. Uh, and also you get a whole bunch now of solution files and CS proj files, uh, which we're going to be able to use to work with our uh, C sharp code. These are only used by the IDE. So these aren't used by Unity at all. So the, uh, the generated project files are just generated purely for the IDE, the IDE being uh, Rider or Visual Studio or whatever it is that you want to use. Um, the assets folder. So let, let's talk about what are assets. Assets are everything that you need to make your game. Uh, and there's a ton of different types of assets from, uh, from scenes, which we've already spoken about as a container for sort of game objects and components uh, and prefabs as well. Uh, and also, you know, things like models, images, textures, animations, uh, and, and so on. And also, of course, scripts, which is very important for our sort of uh, interactive uh, uh, data. Uh, the question is, where do you get your assets from? And if you're not very good with uh, 3D design, like what I am, uh, then, or rather what I'm not, um, then you can also get all of your assets from the asset store. So Unity has an asset store which has got a ton of different assets on there and it can be anything. It can be uh, models, it can be, uh, you know, sort of scenery, characters, vehicles, those kinds of things, but also games as well. Uh, sorry, not games, uh, logic, um, scripts and uh, uh, interactivity there. There's a mixture of free and paid assets. There's also starter kits available on there. You can use this just for prototyping. So it's like, I want to try and prototype a tank game, so let's just grab a bunch of tanks and work with that. Or you can use it because you're not able to design tanks at all and just use those and ship those in the final product. Um, one thing that's really interesting and kind of awkward is that when you import um, assets uh, from the asset store, they get copied directly into your assets folder. So it's like they are now your own code. Uh, this has uh, upsides and downsides. It means you can modify things because you can just change things and they're part of your project. But it's also then uh, the downside is that it's harder to update things because you don't know what you have changed and what has not changed and so on. And it's also harder to know what was originally your code and what was originally somebody else's code. Okay. Um, serialization. So some, some assets uh, are basically unknown file types. So images are going to be ping files, JPEGs, whatever. Uh, same with 3D models, uh, audio, and so on. Um, and other assets are sort of serialized information. So uh, if we're talking about a scene, for example, with all of its game objects and components, uh, this information needs to be uh, serialized and saved, and Unity provides uh, serialization uh, for us. So it supports three different sort of file formats, binary, YAML, and JSON. The binary is now deprecated because it doesn't work nicely with uh, source control. And YAML is the default. Uh, although YAML is text-based and sort of source control diffing will do things sort of line by line, it's still possible to get into problems with uh, source control and YAML files. And Unity has a number of tools which kind of help with that. It's also got support for JSON if you need to talk to web services uh, and things like that. And um, if you take nothing else away uh, from this talk, I'm going to give you the great fact that uh, JSON is actually a subset of YAML. So if you have a YAML parser, you can read in JSON. So it's got nothing to do with Unity. It's just a crazy fact. But it's true. YAML is, sorry, JSON is valid YAML. Go figure. Um, you've got the asset database then. So once you have uh, all of your assets in your assets folder, those are the actual files you're working with, you know, your ping files, your 3D models, uh, your uh, audio, your scripts, and so on. These are stored in the assets folder, uh, but what Unity does, it imports them into uh, what it calls the asset database. Uh, this is where the files are converted into something which is a game-ready format. So it might not necessarily um, be using the 3D model as it's been exported out from a 3D modeling software. Unity can read that, and it can convert it into something that is uh, more appropriate for the target platform. All of this is stored in the library folder, and this is something which you can exclude and not need to use in uh, in your projects. Um, sorry, into, uh, all of this is stored in the library folder, and this is something which you exclude and you don't include in source control. The key thing here is that uh, every asset is assigned a GUID, and uh, this is really important. And this is where meta files come in. Again, this is another topic which is 
not necessarily described terribly well in sort of tutorials and things, but it's massively important. Every file in your assets folder and the packages folder has a meta file. Uh, even folders have meta files as well. So if you have a folder foo, you're going to have a foo.meta file. If you have uh, a C sharp file, enemy.cs, you'll have enemy.cs.meta. And the meta files, as the name suggests, contain metadata about the assets. That's because if you've got a ping file, for example, you're not going to be able to store a GUID inside that uh, ping file, so you need to have another file which lives alongside it. And the big thing that is stored in this file is the GUID there. So you know, we've got an example here. It's all in uh, YAML format. So you've got the GUID, which is the key into the asset database, uh, and it's uh, really important. Uh, and the key thing here is really to uh, always check your meta... No, hang on. Always, always check your no. You, always check your meta files into source control. This is massively important. If you don't do this, bad things will happen. Uh, and the reason for this is because all references between assets is via this GUID. If you lose the GUID, your references are broken and your game breaks. And it's very, very easy to do this. If you forget to check in a meta file, um, you're going to lose uh, a, a reference and things are going to break. So, for example, if you add a script component to a, uh, a game object, that script reference is via GUID. Uh, and if the meta file for that script component doesn't get into source control, that's pointing at nothing, effectively. Unity won't know what that meta file uh, should have been. It'll have a different GUID, and it will break. So it's also really important to make sure that this meta file gets kept up to date with renames and moves and things on uh, and so on. And that was one of the first things that Rider added in for support for Unity was to do that. So if you rename any uh, any files, move any files around, uh, Rider will make sure that all those meta files are kept up to date for you. Right, scripting. But why am I calling it scripting? I've been calling it scripting so far, but that's that's not right. C Sharp isn't a scripting language, it's a compiled language. So why is it, why is it called scripting? And this is perhaps a legacy from uh, Unity Script, which was a uh, another language which Unity allowed you to write your um, interactive logic in, kind of based on JavaScript. Uh, that's no longer supported, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, but it's also because you get a script-like experience. You get hot reloads. So when you edit a C-sharp file, Unity will notice this. It'll automatically recompile. It'll uh, reload any app domains and keep you going. So there's a very sort of quick, nice, hot reload cycle going on, which gives you a bit of a scripting-like experience. When you create a C-sharp script, it's got to derive from uh, mono behavior because it's something that's adding a behavior to a, a, a game object. Uh, and as I've just been saying, all of your script components are referenced by the GUIDs of the C-sharp asset. There's a bit of a, a quirk here because that makes things awkward. If you reference something um, by a GUID, um, that GUID is pointing to a C-sharp file, and that C-sharp file contains a mono behavior. But when you compile your C-sharp, that's going to end up into an assembly. So how does it know what the class is because it was pointing at a file before? And so basically, you've got to... Ha Unity only knows the name of the file, and so it uses the name of the file to know the name of the class that was in the uh, compiled assembly. So you need to keep your name uh, of the file and of the class the same, uh, and everything will be fine. Mono behavior and C sharp scripts give you two main features. Uh, you get event functions uh, and serialized fields. Event functions are methods that are called directly from native code, kind of like reflection, but it's it's not as uh, as heavy as that. It's special mono APIs which will um, find the, the methods you're calling, uh, and cache them and call them directly. There are no interfaces, so everything is matched by name only. And so the, you've got a whole bunch of sort of magic method there. There's a, there's a, there's, you know, it feels like there's a downside to that. You can't have I component and have a whole list of methods that you need to implement. You just need to know which methods there are. Um, but that's actually a good thing because if the methods are there, then Unity is going to call them. And if the methods are there and doing nothing, you've got an overhead for no reason. So if you have, uh, if you're not using a method, you don't don't create it, and it doesn't get called. Um, whereas if you do need it, it's there and it will get called. But you've got no way of easily knowing what that method should be. Uh, fortunately, of course, Rider will do that all for you: code completion and um, inspections to make sure you've got the right things going on there. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of different event functions you can use. Um, key ones are updates. This gets called every frame, and you can do a whole bunch of work in there to sort of figure out what it is that's going on. And you've got things like awake and start for initialization and a whole ones of others for um, 
collision detection, and so forth. Uh, looking at the um, the tower defense starter kit that we were just, just having a quick look at, you've got an update method which is kind of like this. There's a lot going on in there, really. Um, it needs to, it's being called for every frame, so it could be being called 60 times a second. So the first thing it needs to do is, should I do any work right now? So what this is doing is looking to try and find something to target, try and find something to, to shoot at. Uh, and the first thing it does is, am I doing any work here? I'm going to search a number of times per second. And so it'll figure that one out. Then it'll get the nearest targetable item. Uh, if it finds it, it will call a method, uh, sorry, call an event acquired target. And then find it'll aim the turret and get on there. This gets called 60 times a second, and it will sort of update as appropriate. Serialized fields are um, a really useful way of configuring your, uh, your data in your project. And uh, every component can have uh, serialized fields, which allow you to edit your data in the editor itself. Uh, so designers can do it. It's not just up to the coder to uh, figure out exactly how things should be done. And it can be changed at runtime. It can be changed at edit time. Uh, and it can work like, um, the, the, like you can see here with the uh, inspector view there showing you what's going on and showing you ways of editing your, uh, your data. Um, so basically, any public field in a script component is treated as a serialized field. You can also use attributes to specify this. And uh, you can see on the left there, this, this projectile class has uh, four serialized fields, um, one which is sort of the arc preference, the fire mode, the firing angle, and the start speed. Um, Rider actually sort of picks that information out and shows it on the, the page for you and you can click through and navigate to where it's being used. Uh, and it gets displayed in the inspector in Unity, as you see on the right-hand side. There are plenty of other kinds of script components you can do. Um, so things like UI components, buttons, and so on, networking, scriptable objects, which is just a way of storing serialized data. Uh, you can also have editor components. This is really useful because you can configure the way the editor works for you. In fact, if we look at the example here, We've got an editor component for this particular um, script object because we've got four uh, serialized fields, but only three fields in the inspector there. So we've changed the way it works. We've hidden one field, we've added in the title, and we're working with that as an editor component. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other thing as well with, with scripting is that it's not just all about mono behaviors and components and all that kind of thing. You use plain old C sharp as well. So you can have uh, your stuff talking to Unity and doing things. And when it gets called to update, you can go off and use any amount of C sharp that you want to go and do whatever it is that you need to do, such as your artificial intelligence for uh, targeting and, uh, and reacting and so on. Which brings you nicely then to the idea of libraries. Great, we've got NuGet. We've got a whole bunch of libraries we can use and reuse and uh, pull in and well, no, we can't really. NuGet isn't supported, so we don't get NuGet. Um, and that's because Unity works in a different way. Uh, so NuGet is all about sort of assemblies and um, sort of, you know, it's very much sort of code focused, whereas Unity is very much about assets. And again, it's, Unity is not focused on the C Sharp world. You know, C Sharp's a very important part of it, but it's not the whole sort of central part. There's an additional question with uh, Unity is what, what would be the target framework? What is the... DLL that you would choose out of a package to target uh, Unity itself. But there are ways of working with this. You can still use libraries um, with, um, with Unity. It just kind of works a little bit differently. So you can add an assembly as an asset directly. You can drop it into your assets folder. Uh, Unity will bring it all in. It recognizes it as a DLL, and it says, fine, I will use it as a reference when I'm compiling things. And you use it, you can deploy it and it, it will still work, and uh, everything's fine. You can also create a class library project, uh, copy the DLL to assets and work like that. It's not terribly convenient, though, because Unity is in charge of generating all your solution files and CS proj files, so those t things tend to be separate, so it's a little bit awkward. So generally speaking, if you've got a library, you tend to just use it as source inside your assets folder, which just means that your assets folder gets big and unwieldy and kind of awkward. Uh, it also slows down the compile cycle because you've got more work going on there. Uh, so one way of working with this is the idea of assembly definition files, which allows you to split up your um, assets folder into separate assemblies uh, and sort of modularize things a little bit. However, things are 
getting better. Um, recent versions of Unity have introduced uh, a package manager, and so there are packages. Unfortunately, the phrase package is overloaded within Unity, so you've got the idea of uh, the package manager here and, and these kinds of packages, but anything you download from the asset store is also called an asset store package. So it's uh, sometimes a little tricky to know which kind of package you're talking about. Uh, there is work to bring the asset store packages into this package manager, um, but that's that's a way off yet. This is all loosely based on, on NPM. You've got a package.json and uh, dependencies and so forth, and you can uh, see a list of packages there, and you can download those. It'll fill in any dependencies you've got, and everything is good. Um, once you have uh, the packages downloaded, they are treated as, as read-only. They're, they're stored in a, a local cache. They're treated as read-only, and um, you don't get to edit them. Uh, one thing which is really cool about packages, though, is that they contain assets. So this kind of fixes the issue with NuGet just being about assemblies. And packages for Unity can contain any kind of asset. So they can contain images, music, audio, um, models, uh, and script files as well. Everything in a package has a meta file. Uh, and so they then get treated essentially just like they were, as though they were in your assets folder. And so it just becomes part of the asset database, added into your project, uh, and it's almost as if they were part of the assets folder, but now it's nice and separate. So you haven't got that problem of knowing that there's a bunch of code in there that isn't yours, but you've got to maintain and all that kind of stuff. You can distribute assemblies uh, in your asset, uh, in your packages, um, but Unity suggests that you actually uh, distribute your code as, as C-sharp files, as script files. Uh, and one of the sort of main reasons for doing this is that uh, firstly, you can modify them if you need to. Uh, and secondly, you can, um, uh, it, it helps with upgrading. So you can target multiple versions at once with sort of various defines, uh, but you can also, when you upgrade a new version, Unity will run a script upgrader across your files and fix up any APIs that, are, that have might been modified in that particular version. You can also bring your packages into the packages folder. So if you download something uh, which is in sort of read-only mode, you can copy that across into the packages folder and uh, you get, then get to edit them and work with them uh, as, uh, as though it was your own code. And you can also use it for your own code as well. So if you want to create a library that you want to redistribute, you create that in the packages folder and then you just need to zip up that folder to be able to, to distribute. Okay, so um, project files. We need to talk about uh, the project files. So if, if we saw that these would get generated um, when you sort of uh, open up a project, uh, the, some of these, uh, we've kind of got more packages here, I'm sorry, more project files here than we would have expected perhaps. You know, we've got the assets folder there, uh, but we've got a whole bunch more uh, project files. So where did those come from? Well, when you use a package, then um, if you've got those living in the sort of packages folder there, they become one or more projects as well. So we've got a few there with sort of Unity collections, Unity collections.tests, Unity mathematics, and so on. Um, but the main ones really are the assembly C sharp.csproj, which is all the files in the assets folder. And then we've got assembly C sharp editor. And this one's a little bit weird. And this is all to do with more magic folders. Any folder called editor is magic. And basically, any file that lives inside that editor folder um, gets copied into, or sorry, gets referenced by the uh, assembly C sharp editor csproj file. These are files that can contain only editor code. So these are things for editor components. If you want to change how, the way the inspector works, if you want to introduce a new editor window or gizmos, which are um, uh, sort of little sort of handles on the design surface, which make it easier to work with your uh, tools. Uh, they live inside the editor folders and become part of the editor project. There are a few other magic folders, um, resources, plugins, gizmos. We don't need to worry about those. Um, but what becomes tricky with the editor project and the editor folders is that everything is targeting the editor anyway. So the assembly C sharp editor CS proj is for editor files, but all of those files will work exactly the same if you put them into assembly c sharp.csproj. So what's the difference here? Why, why is this? This one, again, was one of those things that took me a little while to figure out. Um, but the idea is that anything that is just an editor component lives inside the editor project, whereas all the other things are supposed to be runtime components. But runtime components can include editor code. 
So I can have a script component, which is runtime, but then it can add extra functionality for when it's being compiled in the editor. So it's almost like debug information. So it can be sort of printing out debug information, as it were, to the editor or handles for easily manipulating things on the design surface, but it is actually still a runtime component. If you need to do that, you have to wrap that in a hash if Unity editor block. If you don't do that, things will break when you try and compile your project and target uh, a standalone player. Okay. Right, versioning. Um, versioning is sadly a little bit more complicated than you'd hope for. Unity versions are fairly straightforward. Uh, these days there are four releases a year based on the, the, the year itself, 2019.1, 0 0.2, 0.3, 0.4. The first three are tech releases. The API can change, they'll introduce new features, uh, that kind of thing. The dot four release is the long-term support release, which is gonna be supported for one year, two years, whatever it is. Uh, and it, this is the stable release, as it were. Uh, all of these versions get, um, get patch releases, maintenance releases. Uh, and one thing that is really interesting to note is that there is a culturally uh, a reluctance to update and to upgrade to a new version. Uh, this is because um, people tend to stick with a particular version while they're working on a game. They want to concentrate on the game rather than worry about the upgrade process. Uh, this might be because they're using assets from other people and they don't know if those assets are going to work on the particular version. Uh, and so they tend to just stick with a particular version for a project and then move up for the next version. Typically speaking, if you're starting a project, you can start with the uh, stable version and you, go, you know you're going to be good. If you know you've got a, a long time and you can factor it in, you can start with the current version and then just upgrade as you go along. It's kind of up to you. And again, if you're doing it for a hobby reason, then you know just use whichever version you want. Mono though, Mono makes things a little bit more complicated. So historically, um, well, as I say, you know, uh, all of your scripting is running on top of Mono. It's not running on .NET Core, or .NET Framework. It's all on Mono. Uh, historically speaking, um, Unity was stuck in an old version of Mono for a long time, and this version used to target .NET 2 effectively. So it was really quite old. It got stuck on C# Sharp 4 and .NET 2 for a very long time, and it was only with the first 2017 release that things got back up to a more modern version. You can't say that it is uh, the current version of Mono, though, because they have their own fork. So they keep it up to date now. It's now uh, sort of equivalent to the modern version, uh, but they have their own fork with Unity-specific things. And one of the uh, cool things they've added, uh, for example, is in one of the recent versions, they've added an experimental incremental garbage collector. So normally when you do garbage collection, it stops the whole world, does a whole bunch of work, and it starts things off. If you're doing 60 frames a second, that's gonna cause issues if you're not careful. So what they've done is have an incremental garbage collector which does chunks of work in between frames. And so your game keeps on playing smoothly uh, and it takes a little bit longer um, wall clock time to do a garbage collector collection, but it should be a whole lot smoother. So um, basically it should be an up-to-date version of Mono, but it's going to be a um, slightly different version. This though also means you've got problems with target framework runtime uh, versions. Uh, and again, this would cause problems if you did bring uh, NuGet in. So previously you had to use .NET 2, now you use a .NET 4 um, equivalent. Because it is mono, you don't quite know what version of .NET 4 that is because that's not how mono works. Mono just implements a bunch of APIs and that's kind of .NET 4 and you know, hope for the best. Um, that is now the default and the stable version, and um, but you're still gonna see this kind of littered about in forums and stuff where people are talking about which version they're supporting and which version you should be targeting. To complicate things even more, you have gotta worry about profiles. So there's a .NET 4 profile and a .NET Standard 2.0 profile. .NET Standard is the default. Uh, and the idea of this is that .NET Standard is gonna be supported on more platforms, um, however, .NET 4 gives you more APIs. So uh, if you know that you're only gonna be working on a small number of platforms, you know, such as I'm only gonna run on Windows, uh, then you can use the .NET 4 one, which is more useful if you need to bring in an external API, sorry, an external library, which is using an API that perhaps isn't supported on, uh, uh, on, a, on a different um, target platform. But the .NET Standard 2 is the default, and unless you specifically need to, don't worry about it, just use it. Uh, and so then that brings us on to C-sharp versions. Previously, it was stuck on C-sharp 4. 
um, when you're updating mono, that brought it up to C sharp six. As the releases since then have gone on, it's just gone straight up to C sharp seven point three. Uh, and they're expected to hit say, C sharp eight anytime now. So we're we, we're kind of keeping up to date again now. So again, previously you, you can see it in forums where people say, "Oh yeah, we're stuck on old versions of C sharp." That's no longer true. You know, can now use uh, new versions of C sharp. Building into projects, uh, as we've seen, if you're in the editor, you don't need to worry about anything. The editor controls everything here. There's no um, project files. The C uh, the editor does everything for you. Monitors file changes recompiles, reloads the app domains, and everything is fine. The CS proj files are just there for the IDEs. Uh, there are APIs to make this a bit more customizable, but we don't tend to need to worry about that. Things get a little bit more interesting when you're building for standalone players, when you actually want to distribute this and not run it inside the editor. You can build for lots of different platforms. You can have a standalone player for Windows, Mac, or Linux, for your um, um, uh, tablet devices, phone devices. Um, and you can also target um, uh, consoles and uh, everything there as well. So you can target PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch. But to do that, you need to be part of a developer program, and that usually means rather heavy NDAs, and nobody ever talks about that. You, if you ask them if they got an NDA, they say no. So it, it's crazy. Um, as part of the build cycle, you're also going to get um, projects built for native tool chains. So you tend to have things need to have things like Xcode installed if you're working for Mac. Uh, and this is because of an interesting question, which is how does Unity support a new platform? If you know how, how do you deport Mono to every single platform? Do you need a wizard who really understands how the PlayStation 4 works to be able to generate a JIT for PlayStation 4? Uh, what happens if the platform doesn't support jitting, like in, in the phone, you know, iPhone? Uh, and that leads you on to a, a really crazy piece of technology that uh, Unity has, which solves this problem, and this is IL to CPP, which will transpile your uh, um, uh, compiled C Sharp files from IL into C++, because every platform has a C++ compiler. So you do need to be an expert on porting mono and writing jits. You just need to have a C++ compiler. Um, it's fairly uh, boilerplate translation to, to, um, to from the IL into C++ there, but it, there are also specific optimizations there which can uh, examine your code as it's being trans, uh, transpiled uh, and remove some things. The debugging story is uh, nice and easy, which is good to know. Um, it's just the mono debugger. Not quite as just as that because you've got a wide range of Unity devices and Unity's got its own forks of mono, so um, uh, all these different versions can cause some headaches for the debugging teams, but that's, again, not for us to worry about. That's for the debugging teams to do. Uh, and the IDE figures out how to connect everything. So if you're using your IDE, it'll automatically configure everything up for you, so you just need to uh, click the debug button and you're good to go. Debugging devices is uh, is fun as well. Um, because mono debugging uh, were, is socket-based, those sockets can be either local or remote. Uh, and so if you've got a device uh, on the network, you just need to point it at the appropriate socket, and it will just start working. When you run um, a Unity app on in debug mode on a device, it will broadcast itself via a UDP message, uh, and that gives us all the information you need to be able to connect to it. Uh, and so it just works. You can use USB as well to sort of tunnel this uh, through uh, USB, and that works then across the platforms. It even works with um, uh, iOS and uh, all those things using IL to CPP because not only did they transpile C, uh, IL to C++, but they wrote the mono debugger in there as well, which is just, you know, bonkers. Um, testing. So everybody tests their C sharp codes, right? Yeah, yeah. You won't do that necessarily so much in the Unity world. Um, it's possible, but it's kind of very much underused and misunderstood and not really uh, well known. Um, there is an NUnit API that you can use. It's got Unity specific features, so you can have uh, a Unity test attribute on a method which allows sort of advancing through frames. So you can do a whole bunch of different tests. And over the years, there have been several different iterations of the API. Uh, with a new iteration, which looks like it's getting a lot more support from the company and documentation, and uh, looks like it's going to going to catch on. Hopefully, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to see more testing. Uh, but the big problem really is knowing what to test and knowing how to test your game. There's very little guidance out there on actually 
how you test an interactive game like this. Uh, one of the kind of downsides to Unity is that it's really quite a closed source world, so you don't necessarily write a game and then put it up on GitHub. You write a game and you ship it and try and make money off it. Uh, and so you don't get to see how other people do things, and that includes testing. Um, a couple of important things to know about testing, though, is that tests must run inside a Unity process. So the Unity, uh, remember that Unity has uh, got a native core, and eventually everything goes down and sort of p-invokes into the native world. If you try and run it in nunit.console, it'll fail because that native world isn't there. And so uh, generally speaking, if you're trying to use an IDE or an uh, and unit console, it will fail, uh, and you have to run it through the uh, Unity process. Two different modes of running, edit mode and play mode. Edit mode is all about testing your ed editor components. You're running as though you're running it in the editor. You can switch in and out, of, you can switch your game uh, in, in and out of sort of play mode, uh, but it's all about testing the actual editor extension themselves. You have play mode tests as well. The game is only in play mode. You can't switch it into editor mode. Uh, and the interesting thing here is you can run these tests on device as well. So you can uh, tell N uh, Unity to run it on the device, which is pretty useful. Uh, and then, of course, just a little plug for Rider because we made Rider talk to the Unity process. So it runs the tests in the Unity process, but we report it inside, um, inside Rider itself. So if you want to be doing testing um, sort of seamlessly through your IDE, give Rider a go. Small plug, sod. Um, right, last couple of things then. Um, profiling is obviously very, very important because performance is, is everything in the Unity world. Unity ships with a massive profiler, which is deep profiling, lots of information. It covers the entire stack, not just your code. So it'll tell you what the CPU is doing, the GPU do, is doing, uh, how the rendering threads are working, what uh, the native threads are doing, and a whole bunch of stuff. This can sometimes be a bit of uh, information overload, so again, Rider with another little plug is very helpful, and we've got dot trace inside Rider working with Unity, and so we can do a code-focused profiling of your code there as well. And there are various inspections which kind of call out sort of performance-related stuff for you. Uh, very last thing then um, is something that's new, the data-oriented tech stack. Um, which is a new architecture. So everything I've told you so far about this uh, game objects and uh, components, they're starting to move away from this, but it's only very slow. So this is still uh, very, very new. They're not uh, recommending people use this in production yet, um, but this is, this is what the future is going to be. They will have migration paths in place, hopefully, uh, to be able to use this uh, better in the future. The problem is with game objects and components is this is really, really bad for uh, doing things in bulk. So if you have a game with a thousand enemies and you want to move a thousand enemies, you have to look up a thousand game objects and for each game object, you have to go and get the transform component, update it, move on to the next one and so forth. Uh, everything being sort of spread out like that is really bad. You kind of have lots of cache misses as you're loading data in and you just can't get the performance. And so the idea for this is that data that changes together is stored together, so you end up with an array of enemy positions, and you just walk across the whole array and set them all, and that's it. And by doing that, you can sort of uh, take advantage of this, uh, this thing they've got, which is the burst compiler, which is a post-processing um, uh, sort of optimizer, effectively, which will auto-vectorize your code, so it uses uh, a whole, does a whole bunch of things in parallel, can do things concurrently, uh, and it's uh, pretty nifty stuff, and it's working nicely now, so they're actually starting to migrate some of their native code into managed code because this burst compiler can do things better and faster than they can do in the, sort of in the native world, which is cool. Um, there is a Megacity demo, which they have uh, they've done. If you just sort of Google for Unity and Megacity, then you'll get to see the, this kind of demo here, which has got millions of, of objects running at once and it's all running nicely and then they show it on a phone as well so this this is a, a nice way of working uh, and it's pretty cool but that's not for now that's for the future and game objects and components will pretty much get you everywhere um, and that kind of is uh, brings me to the end of what I wanted to show you uh, and hopefully you kind of covered a whole bunch of things there which are not necessarily going to be 
obvious inside the tutorials, but will give you a good grounding then to go on and learn those tutorials and things will make a bit more sense. There should be some, you know, holes, things like meta files, which are obviously very, very important. Um, you need now need to sort of know why they're important, why you need to have those uh, across um, uh, in your source control and never ever lose them. Um, next steps would be to go off and actually search for tutorials and go and get hands on and, and uh, give those a go uh, and use the asset store, get some free models, get assets uh, and so on. Uh, and also the starter kits, which uh, are a nice way to see how you do some of these things. Uh, and of course, uh, debrainscom slash unity for uh, Rider, which will give you a lot of uh, hints and tips as well for how to use that kind of thing. Um, I'm at the uh, JetBrains booth as well for the next uh, for the rest of the week. If you have any questions or uh, want to see a demo of any of the sort of Unity type stuff, uh, feel free to come on by. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you for your attention. And we've got a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Time for the boat cruise. <laughs>